In this video, I will be introducing the Turing.jl package. According to its GitHub page, Turing.jl is a Julia library for general purpose probabilistic programming. So what is probabilistic programming? Hmm. It turns out that this is a surprisingly difficult question to answer. So instead of trying to answer the question, I'm going to split this intro to Turing.jl into two tutorials. This tutorial will go through the mechanics of using the Turing.jl package. And the next tutorial will cover the big picture by going through the history, the theory, the concepts, and the terminology of probabilistic programming. With that said, probabilistic programming is a rapidly developing field which has been applied across a wide range of scientific disciplines. So how can we get started with probabilistic programming? Well, let's find out. Welcome to Donko.jl, where I explore the vast Julia wilderness and turn my discoveries into wholesome Julia tutorials. Let's start by getting a crash course on probability distributions by using a Pluto notebook. Let's start by loading the distributions package and the stats plots package along with Pluto UI. Let's start with a normal distribution, which is the hello world of probability distribution curves. The normal distribution has two parameters, the mean and the standard deviation. By convention, the mean is noted by the lowercase Greek letter mu and the standard deviation is noted by the lowercase Greek letter sigma. Rather than going through an exposition, let's just plot the distribution and use sliders to adjust the values of the parameters. The normal distribution is a symmetric, bell-shaped curve centered at the mean and spread out based on the standard deviation. This curve represents a probability distribution, so the values along the y-axis are probability values. The total area under the curve is equal to 1, or 100%. As you move the mean slider, you can see that the curve just shifts side to side, but the shape of the curve doesn't change. As you increase the standard deviation slider, the curve gets flatter and wider. As you decrease the standard deviation slider, the curve gets taller and thinner. Although the height and the width of the curve may change, the shape is always symmetrical and the area under the curve is always equal to one. So that's the normal distribution. Now let's take a look at the Bernoulli distribution. The Bernoulli distribution takes a single parameter P, which is called the success rate. Again, let's just plot the distribution and use the slider to adjust the value of the parameter p. The bars represent values that are either 1 or 0. These values may represent something like true or false yes or no, heads or tails. 
The probability of 1, or the success, is based on the value of the parameter p. So as you increase the value of p, the probability of success increases. This represents a 100% success rate. At the same time, the probability of failure decreases. So the sum of the probabilities is always equal to 1. This represents a 100% failure rate. As you can see, the sum of the probabilities is always equal to 1. So that's the Bernoulli distribution. Now let's take a look at the beta distribution. The beta distribution takes two parameters, alpha and beta. Again, Let's just plot the distribution and use sliders to adjust the values of the parameters. As a side note, the alpha in the plot recipe has nothing to do with the parameter alpha in the beta distribution. In the beta distribution, the values along the x-axis are always between 0 and 1, but the shape of the curve is determined by the values of alpha and beta, which must be positive values. When alpha and beta are both equal to 1, the distribution is flat, showing a uniform distribution. When you increase the value of alpha, the curve shifts to the right. When you increase the value of beta, the curve shifts to the left. You can adjust the values of alpha and or beta to get a unique shape. When the values of alpha and beta are equal, the shape of the curve will be symmetric. With the beta distribution, the area under the curve doesn't always equal 1. Instead, the beta distribution shows the probabilities along the x-axis and shows the frequency along the y-axis. As you can see, the beta distribution is a very flexible distribution. So if you're looking for a distribution curve to fit your data, the beta distribution is a good choice. There are many more probability distributions out there, and you can view them in the distributions.jl documentation. But these probability distributions are enough for us to get started learning probabilistic programming. The hello world of probabilistic programming seems to be the coin toss experiment. In this experiment, you toss a coin 100 times. After each toss, you record whether the coin landed on heads or on tails. At the end, you determine the ratio between heads and tails. So before you make your first toss, what do you think the final ratio will be? Assuming that the coin is a fair coin, you might think that the final ratio should be 50-50, right? But is it really that simple? If you toss a coin 100 times, will the final ratio always be 50-50? Of course not. There's some probability distribution of what that heads-to-tail ratio will be after 100 tosses. 
With that said, let's create a new notebook to go through this experiment. Once without using the Turing.jl package, and then a second time with using the Turing.jl package. Let's start by loading the Turing package and the MCMC chains package along with stats plots and Pluto UI. The code for this experiment comes directly from the Turing.jl documentation. I did make a few modifications to the code, but most of those modifications have to do with using Pluto UI sliders to make the plots interactive. Let's start by assuming that our coin is a fair coin, so that the probability of landing on heads is 50%. Now let's toss our coin 100 times. To collect our data, let's use the Bernoulli distribution to randomly toss the coin. True means heads, and false means tails. The assumption here is that each coin toss is independent of each other and that the probability of each coin toss is identically distributed. We can check the actual probability of heads for our random data set. Okay, so that's not exactly 50%, but it's pretty close. So this data vector contains all of our observations from our experiment. Based on this data, we want to build some type of probability distribution model so we can use it to make predictions about future coin tosses. As a starting point, let's assume that this unknown probability distribution resembles a beta distribution with some unknown values for the parameters alpha and beta. Since we don't know any better, let's start with alpha and beta both equal to one. Next, Let's define a function that will update the shape of our beta distribution based on our observations. In theory, the more observations we make, the more confident we should be in the shape of our probability distribution. For the beta function, you need to use the Unicode characters for alpha and beta to modify the values of those parameters. All this function is doing is adding the number of heads to alpha and the number of tails to beta. Now that we have our probability distribution, let's take a look at it. Let's set up another slider so we can view a range of observations from our data. Moving the slider will not change the data from our experiment. This will just increase the number of observations that we view from this data set. As you can see, as you increase the number of observations, the values for alpha and beta increase accordingly. Now let's plot the probability distribution. So after one observation, the probability distribution reflects only the first coin toss, which is tails. But as you increase the number of observations, the shape of the probability distribution updates 
based on all of those prior observations. The more observations you make, the more confident you are about the shape of the curve. But notice that you're not calculating the value of the probability of the coin toss being heads. Instead, you're coming up with a probability distribution. So even if you toss a fair coin 100 times, the probability of landing on heads could be 50% or it could be 55%, or it could be 45%, or some other percent. The point is, there's a whole range of possibilities, which is why a probability distribution is often more useful than a single number for real-world situations. So this is an example of what life is like before using Turing.jl. Now let's take a look at what life is like after using Turing.jl. The first thing we need to do is to define a probabilistic model based on our data. In Turing, you can do that by using the at model macro in front of a Julia function definition. Turing.jl uses the tilde character to specify a probability distribution for a variable. So here, the probability distribution for the variable p is the beta distribution, with alpha and beta both equal to 1. In this function, p is the prior distribution of the probability of heads in a coin toss and y is the distribution of the observations, which is based on the Bernoulli distribution. The filldist function is from the Turing.jl ecosystem, and this function places the observations into a vector. The filldist function is used for performance reasons. This is a generic function that you can use to obtain samples for both p and y. Note that the value of p is not necessarily close to 50%. If you use shift enter a few times, you can see that the value of p is different every time. This coin toss function is a quote unquote unconditioned function since it's not conditioned on any specific observations. You can quote unquote condition a function by using the vertical bar character. So here, we're creating a new method for the coin toss function. In this new method, the observations y are used as an argument in the function, and by using the vertical bar, the function is conditioned to those observations. We can now use this coin toss function with our data to create a model that is conditioned on our prior data. After defining the model, the next step is to try to use the model to make predictions using an approximation of the probability distribution. This future probability distribution is called a posterior distribution. I'll get into the terminology in the next tutorial, but for now, just know that we're trying to approximate what that future probability distribution looks like by drawing samples from our model. In this case, we're using a sampler named NUTS, which stands for No U-Turn Sampler. There are many different samplers to choose from. Again, I'll get into concepts in the next tutorial, but for now, just know that a sampler is an algorithm for picking samples from our model. These samplers are the secret sauce for probabilistic programming. For the number of samples, let's use a slider so we can change this value later. We can approximate the future probability distribution by using the sample function from the Turing package, and by using our model, our sampler, and the number of samples as arguments. 
With the sample function, if you want to see a progress bar, then flip that keyword argument to true. The result from the sample function is something called a chain. This output displays all of the samples that the NUTS algorithm selected. There's a lot of information in this output, but for now, we're really just interested in the P column, which shows the probability of success for each sample. You can view a summary of all of these samples by using the summary stats function. In the summary, the mean column shows the average value of all of the success probabilities. The average is around 50%, which sounds about right, but it's hard to tell what's going on just by looking at these outputs. Let's generate some plots so we can get a better idea of what's going on. Turing.jl comes with a standard plot to visualize your samples. The plot on the left-hand side tracks the mean value by sample. The plot on the right-hand side is a density plot showing the distribution of the mean values. You can also view a histogram of the samples along with the mean value. Finally, we can create a custom plot to view the probability distribution based on the samples, compared to the probability distribution that we came up with earlier without using Turing. Since we need to enter these plotting recipes inside of a begin and block, the code for this cell will be a little long. You can find all of my code in my GitHub repository. Let's pull our sample slider down and then take a look at this plot. In this plot, the light green shaded area is the probability distribution based on our observed data. The red vertical line is the true probability. The blue curve is the density curve for the future probability distribution that Turing.jl is approximating by taking samples from our model. The blue vertical line is the mean value of the samples. At first glance, this approximation doesn't look very good. The blue curve doesn't look anything like the light green shaded area. That's because we only took 50 samples. As you increase the number of samples, the blue curve gradually begins to look like the light green shaded area. What Turing is doing is learning the probability distribution on its own by drawing samples from the distribution. As it draws more samples, Turing is able to, quote unquote, infer the shape of that probability distribution. With enough samples, Turing should be able to come up with a probability distribution on its own by making inferences based on those samples. In this coin toss experiment, it wasn't necessary to use Turing to come up with a probability distribution. But in many real world situations, it's not possible to come up with a probability distribution by hand. So by using Turing, you can create approximations for probability distributions for problems that couldn't otherwise be solved by hand. And then you can use those approximations to make predictions. 
So this is probabilistic programming in a nutshell. We'll get into some of the pros and cons of using probabilistic programming in the next tutorial. But I do want to highlight that we didn't need a lot of data in order to use probabilistic programming. As a result, you can use probabilistic programming in a lot of different situations, especially when data is difficult to collect. But when using probabilistic programming, you won't be able to come up with a single value as the answer. Instead, what you'll end up with is a range of possible values, along with an approximation of a probability distribution of that range. While that may be more realistic, at the end of the day, a probability distribution may or may not be a satisfying answer for everyone. So those are some things to think about until the next tutorial. Until then, you now have an interactive notebook full of code that you can play with in order to get a better understanding of the mechanics of probabilistic programming. If you made it this far, congratulations! <laughs> if you enjoyed this video and you feel like you learned something new, then please consider smashing that like button, leaving a comment, sharing this video, and subscribing to this channel. If you'd like to support the educational work that I'm doing, then please consider using the Super Thanks button. For ongoing support, please consider joining and becoming a channel member. Channel members get ad-free early access to all of my new videos. Thanks for watching, and good luck on your Julia journey.